Hi everyone, good afternoon. Thanks for having me back. So I have a, a little bit I'd like to do at the top here and then uh, we'll, <laughs> I'm, I'm not gonna take that personally. Thank you, thank you so much for, thank you so much for that. <laughs> so I have a little bit at the top and then uh, I'm of course happy to take your questions. Um, so as the president remains focused on lowering costs for American families, we have a number of announcements today that will help households save money on utility bills. First, the Department of Energy announced over $3 billion from President Biden's bipartisan infrastructure law is now available through the weatherization assistance program for states and territories to retrofit households, make homes more energy efficient, and save families money. The president's infrastructure law increased this program's resources tenfold, which means more homeowners will be able to improve insulation, upgrade lighting and appliances, and electrify heating and cooling systems, all of which save families hundreds of dollars per year while making homes more resilient to climate change and extreme temperatures. Second, the Department of Energy is proposing new energy saving standards for household appliances and equipment as part of a roadmap to complete 100 actions this year that would save families more than $100 annually on their utility bills. And that's actually a very conservative estimate, $100 annually on their utility bills. To give one example of the impacts, U.S. households buy over 7 million room air conditioners every year. And today we're proposing a new efficiency standard that would save consumers up to $275 over the life of the product. Energy also announced new codes that will make federal buildings more energy efficient, reduce operating costs, and ensure we are good stewards of taxpayer dollars. Together, these efforts can save more than $15 billion in net costs, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and advance environmental justice. From implementing his infrastructure law to updating important standards, these actions show the president following through on his mission to lower costs for working families and help them save money each month on their energy bills. And then secondly, I'd like to say, uh, yesterday, the full Senate took its first vote on the nomination of Lisa Cook, an important step forward toward confirming her and our other qualified nominees for the Federal Reserve. We need to confirm Dr. Cook, along with the other three qualified nominees, Jerome Powell for chair, Lael Brainerd for vice chair, and Philip Jefferson for a seat on the Board of Governors, so that the Federal Reserve can move ahead in its work to help address inflation. We call on senators on both sides of the aisle to support these nominees because they are eminently qualified to serve. This is important, and we hope the Senate can get it done soon so they can get to work. So thank you very much. And with that, AP. Thanks, Kate. Um, AP is reporting uh, plans by the administration to uh, end Title 42 by May 23rd. Is the Biden administration prepared to deal with the aftermath of ending Title 42 and the expected influx of migrants? So first what I would say is that uh, this is a decision that we have long deferred to CDC. Title 42 is a 
public health directive. It is not an immigration or migration enforcement measure. So the decision on when to lift Title 42, we defer to the CDC. Um, that being said, of course, we are planning for uh, multiple contingencies. And we have every expectation that when the CDC ultimately decides it's appropriate to lift Title 42, there will be an influx of people to the border. And so we are doing a lot of work to plan for that contingency. I think you saw yesterday the Department of Homeland Security uh, did a briefing walking through some of the planning uh, that they're doing to increase efficiency, to ensure that we have the capacity to ensure that uh, we are uh, operating in a way that's, uh, that is treating migrants humanely, fairly. Uh, so you heard from them yesterday on some of the planning that they're doing more broadly. Now, not specifically tied to Title 42 or, or an ultimate decision to lift it, but just more broadly to the work that they're doing to, uh, uh, to continue to build up our uh, migration system and ensure that we are restoring order at the border. And, and then secondly, um, if Putin has bad information, per declassified U.S. intelligence, what does that mean for the war in Ukraine and the prospects for negotiations right now? Well, I certainly am not a spokesperson for the Kremlin and cannot speak to what is in Vladimir Putin's head. Uh, what I can say uh, is, of course, we have information that Putin felt misled by the Russian military, which has resulted in persistent tension between Putin and his military leadership. We believe that Putin is being misinformed by his advisors about how badly the Russian military is performing and how the Russian economy is being crippled by sanctions because his senior advisors are too afraid to tell him the truth. So it is increasingly clear uh, that Putin's war has been a strategic blunder that has left Russia weaker over the long term and increasingly isolated on the world stage. Uh, on that, I mean, in the lead up to, to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the administration declassified information like this to, to sort of lay out what Putin's intentions were. You seem to be doing that again now uh, by making it clear that he's being misled by his advisors. Can you just discuss what's the hope and the goal in going public with this now? So again, I think what this does is paint a picture of what a strategic error uh, Putin and, and Russia have made here. We saw from the outset that they, for example, made an aggressive push toward Kyiv at the beginning of, of the invasion. Uh, they are now publicly trying to redefine the goals of their uh, invasion to be, um, to be different than they were at the outset. I think uh, putting forward this information uh, simply contributes to uh, a sense that this has been a strategic error for them. Again, I'm not going to characterize you know, what they are thinking. I'm certainly not going to characterize uh, how they may or may not use this information to make decisions. That's not my place. Uh, but I do think that making this information public uh, contributes to an understanding that this has been a strategic failure for Russia. Obviously, we will continue to pursue our strategy of imposing severe costs on Russia. Uh, and trying to strengthen Ukraine on the battlefield and at the negotiating table. And if Putin is being misinformed like this, then who is really pulling the strings here? That's not a question that I'm able to speak to from this podium. I think this is a, uh, again, I don't speak for the Kremlin. Uh, what I can speak to is what uh, the, in the information that we see, uh, which, uh, again, as I say, shows that he has felt misled by the Russian military and has resulted in this persistent tension. And just lastly, how does this impact concerns about whether you know, any deal that, that may be negotiated with Russia, between Russia and Ukraine, can be trusted? Well, again, we are not negotiators in that process. We are obviously in close contact uh, with the Ukrainians as they work through this process. Again, our role is to do everything we can to strengthen Ukraine on the battlefield, as we've done with uh, the security assistance, the unprecedented amount of security assistance uh, and weapons that we've flowed to uh, to Ukraine, uh, and also to strengthen strengthen their hand at the negotiating table by continuing to apply uh, incredibly severe costs and sanctions uh, on Russia. And on the intelligence, um, is your is your expectation that releasing this information um, is are you hoping that it changes Putin's calculus or the military's calculus as they approach these things? Uh, it is, that is not our intent. Our intent is simply to make the information available uh, so that there is a full understanding uh, of what kind of strategic blunder this has been uh, for Russia and for the Russian people. And is there anything any more that you can share just about, um, you know, whether this is uh, an, an assessment that you're extremely confident in? I know, you know, typically there's a range of views among analysts across the intelligence agencies about how solid information is. Is there anything you can tell us about how solid this is and, and what is underlying this that gives you the confidence that this is the right reading? 
Well, I can't speak uh, more specifically to the intelligence uh, because we obviously do not uh, do anything to compromise sources or methods. Uh, I will simply say we have made it public and allow you to draw a conclusion from that. So does uh, the U.S. believe that Putin is now fully aware of the misinformation, that he now has a clear picture of Russia's uh, military operations and how badly it is performing? Well, again, I, I would just say that we obviously have information, which we have now made public, uh, that he uh, felt misled by the Russian military. Um, we believe he's being misinformed by his advisors about how badly the Russian military is performing and how the Russian economy is being crippled by sanctions uh, because, again, his senior advisors uh, are too afraid to tell him the truth. Uh, beyond that, I can't, characterize, I, I can't characterize any further than that. Are there any um, examples that you might be able to offer us other than Putin not knowing initially that uh, his military was using and losing conscripts in Ukraine uh, that show how Putin was potentially being misinformed by his advisors? I don't have any detail beyond what we've made public already. Oh, okay. One more. Um, U.S. officials have obviously been saying since yesterday that the U.S. is not going to be fooled by uh, Russian claims about a withdrawal from Ukraine uh, until you all see it happen on the ground. Uh, does President Zelensky share in that skepticism? I, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. Ask that one more time. You all have been saying that you're not going to be fooled by uh, Russia's assessment or promises that it is going to start withdrawing uh, and start pulling back on military attacks right, in Ukraine. Right. Wondering if President Zelensky, since he spoke with President Biden, does he share in that assessment? Right. Well, I won't, I won't characterize President Zelensky's thinking, but I will say that we continue to see evidence today of Russia uh, attacking, advancing, attacking in places where they had previously said they would not. So I think um, that is uh, self-evident, and obviously we continue uh, to do everything we can to flow assistance, security assistance, uh, to, the, to, uh, to the Ukrainians. Hey, Kate. <clears throat> um, back to Title 42 for a minute. Um, back in the spring of last year, there was a very large surge of families, record surge of children at the at migrant children at the border um, that overwhelmed Border Patrol stations took a long time to get them moved into HHS, into uh, sort of temporary shelters and then ultimately to HHS. Um, since then, there hasn't been a, a major overhaul of the immigration system. Legislation that the President proposed is completely stalled in Congress. Um, you know, there have been some sort of tweaks and, and, and um, changes around the edges, but there hasn't been a wholesale kind of rethinking or change of the asylum system at the border, uh, the MPP program that Donald Trump put into place is, is back in place by a court order, but it's also at a very low level. So what is there in place now, if there is another surge in the next month or two when this is lifted, what is there in place that gives the administration confidence that, that some different result will happen than happened a year ago? Well, I think if you look back to the spring, to the time period you're referencing, um, uh, there was an effort to move those unaccompanied minors as quickly as possible out of Border Patrol custody and into facilities that were more suited for children. And we were able to dramatically reduce those numbers. They were in the thousands uh, over the course of a couple of months uh, through the work of DHS and others, uh, and HHS, I should say. Uh, we were able to dramatically reduce those numbers, move those kids quickly out of Border Patrol Border Patrol custody and into, uh, into the system. So I think, um, you know, if you look at what we were able to do last spring, there was, uh, there was an ability to, uh, to move those numbers and uh, move those children uh, uh, quickly into uh, more, uh, into facilities that were uh, better suited for them. Um, writ large, I would, uh, again, point to the things that uh, the President has done to try to rebuild what was, if you uh, remember when we took, came into office, a system that was decimated by the previous administration. The previous administration spent four years trying to tear apart uh, a lot of the uh, pieces of our uh, immigration system. Uh, and so we were in many ways building from, you know, I won't say scratch, certainly, but we were building from uh, a, a, a place where uh, a lot of this, these pieces have been torn down. So. What we focused on and what the president has focused on uh, is working with the Department of Homeland Security to give clear guidance for internal enforcement, um, extending and uh, newly designating TPS, temporary protected status for a number of countries, restarting the Central American Minors program that the previous administration ended, 
um, putting together the Family Reunification Task Force, which we have made some progress on, reunifying some of those families who were torn apart under the previous administration. Um, of course, ending the Muslim ban uh, and the public charge rule and uh, protecting DACA recipients. So uh, this president has taken uh, numerous important substantive steps. Of course, there is more work to do. There is absolutely more work to do, but we've taken uh, serious strides forward since we took office last year. Okay, and then just one, one quick follow-up. Um, you, you said again the line that the administration has used a lot, which is that the Title 42 isn't an immigration uh, policy, it's a public health policy. Has the president, has Ron Klain, has anybody else in the senior administration tried to overrule uh, the CDC over during the past year in its efforts to lift Title II prior to now? No. Thank you. Um, on COVID, um, can you help us understand, you guys have laid out sort of what, what happens if the money runs out that you're requesting. Can you remind us, what in the view of the White House is the most urgent item on that list that runs the risk of not being funded? And Republicans again today are saying the money for this is there in the previously passed legislation. And there's one figure they're saying is $160 billion. Uh, is there from the COVID relief bill. What is the White House response to that suggestion? Uh, so firstly, uh, this is funding that's going to be used to uh, to provide tests. It will uh, fund additional uh, vaccines. For example, as we were talking about yesterday, should there come a time where uh, a fourth shot is recommended for the broader population? Um, uh, it, will, uh, it will also fund uh, life-saving treatments. Um, and also our ability to, uh, to additionally provide vaccines around the world, which is another piece of ensuring that the virus is not able uh, uh, to, um, uh, to move around the globe. Um, so, you know, this is critically important funding. The stakes are very real and very high. Um, you have heard the president state this uh, repeatedly, uh, that this is critical in order for us to continue our progress. The other thing I would say about this funding is that it will allow us to prepare for the eventuality, the possibility, I shouldn't say eventuality, the possibility um, of another variant, another wave. It will give us the funding that we need to be prepared uh, for the future. So um, it is critically urgent uh, in that way. And I'm sorry, what was the second well, part of your question? that they say the money's already there, that there's unused funds from previously passed legislation. So obviously, we initially proposed this as emergency uh, funding, but we are, uh, uh, working with the Congress. The Congress is working to get this done. The President's been very clear that it should get done. How the, uh, how the mechanism uh, of finally coming to an agreement on this uh, works out, we'll leave that to the Congress. But uh, the President's been very clear that we need this funding and that it's urgent. And to follow up on something he said earlier, that he may have a meeting with the family of Trevor Reed, they're trying to make that happen. Is that happening today or some point soon? Don't yet know if it's happening today, but I spoke to the president about this earlier. You obviously all heard from him. He is uh, very eager to meet with the family, and we're working through uh, when that's possible. President? Thank you, Kate. Um, I want to ask you about the call with President Zelensky, but just a couple more um, on this new information about Putin being left in the dark by his military advisors. Who authorized the release of that intelligence? That's not something I can speak to. Obviously, uh, uh, it was declassified and put forward into the public sphere. Can you say, did the president sign off on this? I, I cannot speak to that, except to say that this is information that we uh, declassified and made public. Okay. There has been so much discussion about the concerns of, over whether Putin would use chemical weapons, uh, nuclear weapons, biological weapons. Does this increase the administration's concern that Putin might lash out? in that way? Well, as I say, I'm not going to characterize what uh, Vladimir Putin is thinking, what the Kremlin is thinking, or how this might impact their calculus. That is not uh, the intent of putting the information forward. What it does is underscore that this has been a strategic blunder uh, for Russia. Um, but I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to characterize uh, how, you know, Vladimir Putin uh, might be thinking about this. I will say um, uh, that we are prepared for any and all contingencies. As you know, there's a lot of work going on uh, to be prepared uh, for contingencies. And we've also been very clear 
uh, that should uh, Russia act in that way, there will be severe consequences. On the call, Kate, um, the readout that the White House put out says the leaders discussed how the United States is working around the clock to fulfill the main security assistance requests by Ukraine. I, we don't know what specifically the president of Ukraine asked for of President Biden, but publicly at least he has called for those Polish MiGs. He's called for anti-aircraft. Has the president changed his decision in that space? Is he now potentially more open to providing the Polish mix, given that statement? We have provided, excuse me, we have provided uh, an unprecedented amount of security assistance uh, to Ukraine, including uh, anti-air, anti-tank uh, systems, small munitions, things that our military have have assessed are the most impactful weapons. Uh, on the battlefield in Ukraine. So as the president is making a decision about uh, what to send, he takes into account two things. First, the assessment of our military about what is most impactful, what is uh, best able to help the Ukrainian armed forces turn back Russian aggression. And we've seen that the weapons that we have provided have been instrumental uh, in helping them. Uh, and then secondly, and then secondly, as he has said many, many times, he is not looking for uh, direct American military conflict with the Russian military. He's been clear that uh, providing uh, the planes makes this, uh, uh, there are logistical complications to providing the planes, uh, and he's not going to make decisions that is going to lead to direct conflict between the United States military and the Russian military. And President Zelensky has been clear, including when he addressed NATO, he doesn't think it's enough. He doesn't think that NATO is doing enough. He thinks that there, yes, has been a lot of assistance, but it doesn't go far enough for him to achieve the goals. Again, the scope, the scope and scale of the assistance, the uh, security assistance that we have provided to the Ukrainians is unprecedented. We have uh, worked very, very closely with them. Again, as they discussed on the call today, we've worked very closely with them to provide them uh, with the weapons that they need. And again, the president takes into account those two factors that I was just talking about when making decisions. But that being said, he, we have sent uh, $2 billion uh, in security assistance to Ukraine, and we continue to supply them. Those, um, uh, those deliveries are happening daily, every day. Uh, those weapons are being delivered. Uh, so we are doing everything. Um, uh, the president is making every effort to ensure that they are getting what they need. Very quickly, any reaction to former President Trump calling on Putin? to release information about Hunter Biden? Are you concerned about that? <laughs> so what I would say about that is what kind of American, let alone an ex-president, thinks that this is the right time to enter into a scheme with Vladimir Putin and brag about his connections to Vladimir Putin? And there is only one, and it's Donald Trump. Uh, thank you, Kate. Earlier today, Germany said it is willing to act as a security guarantor for Ukraine as part of the peace negotiations between Ukraine and Russia. Is the U.S. willing to become a guarantor of Ukraine's security or considering that option? So we are in constant discussion with the Ukrainians about ways that we can help ensure that they are uh, sovereign and secure, but there's nothing specific about security guarantee that I can speak to at this time. Do you have any more information on the $500 million in budgetary aid uh, for Ukraine that was mentioned as part of the readout between the president's call with President Zelensky? Um, did President Zelensky specifically ask for this to help pay for salaries and other government functions? And is it coming out of the $13.6 billion in Ukraine-related funding in the omnibus, or is it separate from that? So it is financial assistance the Ukrainian government can use to bolster its economy and pay for budgetary expenses, such as paying salaries and maintaining government services. Um, we don't yet have additional detail on where the money is coming from. That is being worked through, uh, but it is a commitment uh, that the president made today. Lastly, what is the administration's current view of whether the U.S. Embassy in Moscow should remain open, um, and how is the administration going about evaluating whether or not to keep the embassy open? So I don't have any additional news to make on that at this moment. Uh, obviously, we will come back to you if there's development on that front, but there's nothing new that I can announce uh, from this podium at this moment. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Um, on the economy, uh, the yield curve for the 10-year Treasury note has inverted. Uh, historically, this is viewed as a sign that investors are pessimistic about the long-term view of the economy and they expect a recession is nearing. So um, can you tell us what the White House believes is the prospects for recession nearing and how concerned you might be about it? Sure. Uh, so, you know, as Chairman Powell said after the last Fed meeting, all signs are that this is a strong economy and the probability of a recession within the next year is not particularly elevated. Uh, our team looks at a broad range of indicators to understand the health of the economy now and going forward. Uh, this is one, but there are many, many others. 
Uh, and the other important indicators to, uh, to include as we are assessing uh, where the economy stands um, are things that, frankly, because of the President's economic plan, uh, you know, we're able to confront from a position of strength. So that's, for example, the fastest economic growth in nearly 40 years, a record 7.4 million jobs created, the fastest decrease in unemployment on record to 3.8 percent, and the first major economy to return to pre-pandemic levels. So while historically uh, this has been one indicator, uh, it is far from the only one, and many of the other fundamentals that we look at to assess where we are economically are incredibly strong and getting stronger. And then on the meeting later today between uh, President Biden and moderate and progressive House Democrats, uh, what should we see as a sign of this meeting? I, are we, should we expect that there's going to be some kind of consensus around a plan on the domestic side that is going to be ready to ship over to the Senate? Or can you tell us more about what they're going to discuss sure. on the executive action front? Sure. Uh, so this is part of his continued engagement with the Hill. He's been meeting with uh, a number of different caucuses over the course of the last month. He and, this, and our senior team here at the White House, uh, we are obviously uh, constantly in close contact uh, with the Hill. I would not uh, I would not view this as a uh, decision-making meeting. This is a discussion of our shared priorities. Uh, I would not anticipate a deliverable coming out of it. This is, uh, again, a continued discussion of our strategic priorities as we try to move forward uh, on our agenda. And then just really quickly on India, uh, Dalip Singh is there for the next couple of days meeting with officials. Uh, mm -hmm. Is the U.S. frustrated with India's response uh, to, the, to Russia's invasion of Ukraine? And uh, what kind of message is Dalip and his team going to be delivering to the Indian government on that front? Sure. Um, so as you note, uh, Dalip will be, uh, will be in New Delhi to uh, continue our ongoing consultations with the government of India and advance a range of issues in the U.S.-India economic relationship and strategic partnership. He will meet with the government of India to uh, deepen cooperation, to promote inclusive economic growth and prosperity, and a free and open Indo-Pacific. He will consult closely with counterparts on the consequences of Russia's unjustified war against Ukraine uh, and mitigating its impact on the global economy. He will also discuss the priorities of the Biden administration, including the promotion of high-quality infrastructure through Build Back Better World, and the development of an Indo-Pacific economic framework. Okay. Hi. Um, I know this was asked yesterday, but in the last 24 hours, has this White House learned anything about why there is that gap in call logs on January 6th from the Trump White House that was given over to the Select Committee? Uh, we have not. My answer has not changed from 24 hours ago, which is that I would refer you to uh, to the archives on that. Uh, but certainly, where we can cooperate, where we are needed to cooperate uh, to fill in that gap, we will. But I would I would refer you to the archives on that. Okay. And then um, regarding the 500 million dollars to Ukraine, um, what is the current explanation of why the president hasn't sent over a nominee to the Senate to be the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine right now? What's the current thinking on that? Uh, that's an excellent question, and I'll have to circle back with you on. Thanks. Hey, on the on the pandemic, the president got his second booster shot today, but more than half of American adult Americans have not gotten their first booster shot, even as public health, uh, you know, officials warn about a fall increase, a BA two variant. Um, I wonder, is is the White House concerned about that? Like, what what is the White House doing to sort of help close that gap? What's the message to Americans? Well, our message to Americans, first and foremost, is uh, to get vaccinated and get boosted. It is the best way to protect yourself from the virus and to protect against the spread of the virus. Um, what I would say about uh, what I would say about BA2 um, is that uh, you know it is certainly more transmissible than the original Omicron strain, but there's no evidence that it's more severe uh, than Omicron. Our vaccines continue to work well against BA2, uh, particularly, again, with uh, if the high level of protection provided by boosters. Um, so we continue to both encourage people to get boosted, but um, I would also point to all the work that we've done to make boosters available, to make vaccines available. There are 90,000 free locations nationwide where you can get, uh, where you can get vaccinated and boosted. Um, and then lastly, I would, I would revisit uh, something we were talking about earlier, which is that we need Congress to pass the $22.5 billion in emergency COVID funding immediately uh, so that we can maintain our tools to protect people and to be uh, fully prepared for the possibility of any new variants. Yeah, one more on that, that last part. Mm -hmm. Has the President or the White House reached out specifically to any of these legislators who have lobbed criticism that, you know, you haven't used the money that's already been allocated for pandemic, the, the fight against the pandemic? 
I don't have any specific uh, engagements to read out. But obviously, we continue to work closely with the Hill. The president has stated very clearly that there is an urgent need for this money uh, and wants to see it wants to see it done. Well, how, how after printing trillions of dollars, taxpayers might want to know: Is there not enough money to continue fighting the pandemic? Trillions of dollars. We have. You're out of it. Is the, all the accounting done? Every single dollar. So we have the resources that we need in this current moment. What we need is this funding to be able to plan for the future, to prepare for, uh, for as I say, the possibility of a new variant, the possibility of a new wave. We don't want to be caught flat-footed. We currently have, for example, all of the vaccine supply that we need to vaccinate and boost every American. But what we need to have this money for is to prepare to be ready uh, for the future, as we as we know, the uh, you know the virus can be unpredictable, and we need to be prepared. And there's an urgent need to do that. Right, but can you see where right. taxpayers would be skeptical? I mean, trillions of dollars, and all of a sudden, billions more. I think taxpayers want to be prepared uh, for the virus, and they want to make sure that we have the resources that we need to keep them safe. And that's what this administration is focused exactly. on. Why no high Kate, protections Kate, sorry, sorry, check. Kate yep. has called. Um, the president has called Putin a war criminal. He said that he believes he will meet the legal definition of a war criminal. And the U.S. has vowed to pursue all accountability measures, including prosecution. Sentencing for war crimes is long-term imprisonment. So how does all of that not equate to calling for regime change? The president has been incredibly clear about this. He is not advocating for a policy of regime change. Uh, he, What he said uh, a couple of days ago was a statement of personal moral outrage. Uh, but we do not have a formal policy of regime change. What we are doing uh, is continuing to impose unprecedented costs on Russia. We are ensuring that uh, that the uh, Russian uh, that Russia is paying for this choice. Uh, you know, Putin himself has said that uh, the costs, the impact of the sanctions, uh, has been uh, has been uh, significant. Um, so we are continuing to uh, to focus on our strategy of. Uh, making sure that we are providing security assistance to Ukraine uh, and imposing significant costs on Russia uh, for these choices. So when he said that he believes Putin will meet the legal definition of war criminal, was he not saying that he believes he will be convicted of that crime? He was not, in fact. Um, and then does the, the president and the national security team here believe that Ukraine can win and push Russia out of its borders? And if so, has the U.S. adjusted its strategy at all in helping Ukraine since they started to win? Well, I, I would argue that from the outset that we've done uh, everything in our power, a tremendous, tremendous amount, uh, to provide Ukraine with what it needs, to provide it with the resources to turn back Russian aggression. That has been the focus of our strategy, again, a two-pronged strategy to impose costs and provide uh, the both the um, uh, the security assistance and the humanitarian assistance uh, to support Ukraine. Is there any, any reason why no one from this administration has just plainly said, we think Ukraine can win this war? We, I think in our actions and in uh, the support that we've provided, we've been very clear uh, that we're doing everything we can to stand with Ukraine and ensure that they uh, are able to push back uh, against Russian aggression. And just one more on the southern border. Uh, has DHS requested National Guard troops to be sent to the border? Is that something the administration is considering? Uh, as far as I know, that is not currently under consideration, but I'm happy to check in on it and come back to you. Yes. Thanks. Um, first, uh, Senator Susan Collins came out and in support of Judge Jackson's confirmation to the Supreme Court today. Uh, do you have a reaction to uh, the kind of confirmation that you'll have a bipartisan vote there? And then also, you know, in her statement, uh, she said that the the process um, is, is broken and that uh, it should go back to kind of being based on qualifications, experience, and not ideology. And I'm curious what you think of that. The president is incredibly grateful uh, to Senator Collins for her thorough and fair consideration and her support. Uh, the two of them spoke earlier in this process, uh, and he appreciated her thoughts and her insight. Um, obviously, her support speaks to the qualification uh, of Judge Jackson uh, to sit on the Supreme Court. She. Uh, Judge Jackson has been working hard to earn support and, you know, as you well know, responded to Republicans' requests for in-person meetings by promising to sit down with any senator uh, who wanted. And uh, she has engaged very directly. She answered uh, over 20 hours of questions. Um, and, you know, she has earned the support of uh, some of the most respected retired conservative judges in the country and the Fraternal Order of Police uh, and so many others in law enforcement. Uh, so. Uh, she uh, is 
an incredibly qualified um, uh, nominee for the Supreme Court, uh, and the President is uh, very grateful for Senator Collins' uh, measured, reasonable, thorough, and fair consideration uh, and ultimately support for her. What did uh, he make of the other part of the statement, or the White House make of the other part of the statement, that, that the process as a whole is, is broken? Well, I think what we're seeing uh, in, immediate, in, the, in the immediate case uh, is that the process is moving forward. She's receiving uh, fair consideration. Uh, I think she was, the President was incredibly proud uh, of the way she handled herself during the hearings uh, and thought she very effectively spoke to her judicial philosophy um, uh, and handled incoming criticism. So I won't speak to the whether the process writ large is broken, as we are focused uh, narrowly in this moment on the process in front of us. And I would say the process in front of us is working. And I think, uh, uh, again, you know, Senator Collins' uh, support today, um, uh, the president was very grateful for. Yeah, um, back to the intel release. I'm wondering if this is partially just an effort to embarrass Vladimir Putin, to sort of publicly shame him or, or something. It, 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 it comes across as, you know, you, you, you say that you can't speak for the Kremlin, but then you're saying he feels misled by his advisors. It, it seems like there might be something going on here. No, no. Our aim, again, our aim is to show that uh, this has been a strategic blunder for Russia, uh, that there is um, uh, ultimately uh, this is going to leave them weaker. It is not going to leave them stronger. And I think uh, making this information public simply contributes to, uh, to the picture that, uh, that strategically um, uh, they are having to, uh, to reorganize, to refit. Uh, and, and that shows that, um, again, this was uh, a terrible decision for them. And at the end of the day, as we've long said, as we've said from the outset, uh, as we said even uh, before they invaded, uh, we said that this would be a strategic mistake for them. And I think that that is borne out. And going back to the COVID funding, I think it was your answer to Ed. Um, I, I'm trying to read between the lines just a little bit, but you had said, previously we asked for $22 billion as emergency funding that wouldn't need any offsets. Now we would like Congress to get us this money. Um, are you saying that you're willing to accept offsets? Uh, that you, and also, are you willing to accept less than the $22 billion? Well, what I would say is we have been very clear that we need this money now, and we're hopeful that Congress is nearing a solution. Um, and, you know, again, the President called for this initial $22.5 billion uh, as emergency funding. But at the end of the day, we need the money. It's important. It's critical for our preparedness for the next, uh, you know, the next phase of, of COVID and being prepared so that we're not caught flat-footed. So uh, ultimately, uh, we, are, uh, uh, we are hopeful that Congress is nearing a solution on this. So we should take that as you're willing to accept the offsets. You should, no, you should take it as what I said, which is that we're hopeful that Congress is reaching a solution on this, and Congress will determine uh, ultimately where we net out on this. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, going back to her question, who the White House believes is winning this war? I think that uh, the White House believes that uh, Ukraine has been uh, has fought valiantly, has uh, has been uh, incredibly um, brave and uh, resolved in the face of of um, atro of atrocious, brutal uh, invasion from Russia. I think what you've seen in the actions uh, from this White House. Uh, is that we have provided weapons, we have provided assistance, we have been there uh, every step of the way and will continue to be, uh, and we have put enormous, enormous economic pressure uh, on Russia uh, in order to, uh, in order to uh, hopefully uh, drive this conflict uh, to, to a solution. So, um, you know, I think, again, I don't know that I have to say it. I think that our actions show uh, and the support that we provided shows that, uh, that uh, we believe that Ukraine has been uh, incredibly, um, incredibly brave, incredibly strong, and we're going to continue to support them as they move forward. Uh, do, do, do you want another yeah, one? do you mind? Yeah. Because President Zelensky just tweeted uh, also that President Biden and him talk about uh, a new package of sanctions. Could you, do you have anything more specific on that? So I don't have anything that I can preview in this moment, but certainly we are continuing to look at options to, uh, to expand and deepen our sanctions, and I anticipate that we would probably have more for you on that in the coming days. Okay, thank you, Kate. Uh, two quick ones, hopefully. Um, could you give us any steer on the additional capabilities bit of that readout in, from the Zelensky call? Um, is, there, is there a shift in thinking perhaps that Ukraine needs a different category of weapons, not just enough to hold the Russians back, but actually to push them, push them back? So, 
so an example of uh, one of the one of those additional capabilities, something that we talked about uh, a little bit last week while we were in Europe, uh, you know, uh, uh, shore uh, ship to shore uh, capability, anti ship capability. That's just one example. Um, you know, beyond that, I'm not going to go into further detail on what's being discussed, except to say that we're doing everything we can to ensure uh, that Ukraine has what it needs on the battlefield. Thank you. And the other one is uh, today, Boris Johnson said. Very black and white, he said sanctions, Western sanctions, not just British, all G7 sanctions should stay in place until the Russian troops are all gone. That was a lot more black and white than anything that's come out of the White House. Um, do, do you, does the White House share that kind of uh, maximalist goal with sanctions? Are they going to stay there until the last Russian troops are gone? That's uh, not something that I'm going to uh, to be able to pre-state uh, in this moment. Uh, I, will let, uh, I will let Boris Johnson and the UK government speak for themselves. Uh, yes. Yeah, thanks, Kate. Um, there have been some reports recently that some Democratic senators on the Hill have expressed concerns um, about Eric Garcetti's nomination um, to be ambassador to India. Um, does the White House still have confidence in him and uh, its ability to get him confirmed? Uh, we do. Uh, we do have the president has confidence in Mayor Garcetti, believes he will be an excellent representative in India. Uh, I would remind you that his nomination advanced unanimously with bipartisan support uh, in committee. And we're continuing to engage with senators and working to earn bipartisan support for his nomination uh, and believe he should receive a vote in the Senate expeditiously. Yeah. And um, earlier this month, uh, uh, President Zelensky signed a decree to combine Ukraine's national TV channels into one platform, uh, saying he wants to create a, a unified information policy. Um, Ukraine also announced that it was banning 11 political parties with ties to Russia. Um, is the White House concerned at all about these moves um, by the Ukrainians? So this is the first that I'm hearing of it. I will look into it. I'm happy to talk to our national security team and get back to you. Thanks. Kate. Uh, thanks, Jen. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> High praise. <laughs> um, you had mentioned that the administration encourages boosters. You talked about the work you've done on that. But given that COVID cases are down and that the pace of boosters has been sluggish, will there be an actual public campaign by the president or the administration, more of an outward effort to get people to get their boosters? Well, I think we'll, we will continue to do the work we've been doing. And today we uh, launched a new website, covid.gov, which gives people uh, what they need to uh, track transmission in their community, to find a test to treat location. So an opportunity, a uh, location where you can go, you can get a test. And uh, if you're positive, you can get an antiviral. Uh, so this uh, website is part of our effort, our continued and ongoing effort to make sure that people have what they need uh, to deal with COVID as we move into uh, uh, potentially the next phase of this uh, of, of this disease. Um, you know, from the outset, we have said and continue to believe because the science shows that getting vaccinated, getting boosted, uh, is the best thing that you can do in order to protect yourself from the virus. So. That has been a big piece of our uh, public messaging. That's been a big piece of our message to the country, and it will continue to be. The president today described this new moment where he said COVID no longer controls our lives. How critical is it that Americans get boosted to stay in this new moment right now? It's, it's important, Amer and our message has consistently been that it is important to, uh, it's important to get boosted. The science shows it is the best way to, to prevent the spread of the virus and to, um, uh, and to protect you and your loved ones and your family and your friends from getting sick. So uh, our message will always be it is important uh, to go out and get boosted. We, have, uh, we are doing everything in our power. We have done everything in our power to make sure that boosters are free and available uh, to everybody in the country. Yes. Thank you. Um, regarding the president's budget proposal, which was released earlier this week, uh, Senator Manchin is already saying that he can't support this so-called billionaire's tax because it would tax unrealized gains on certain assets. I wanted to hear your response to that, and I'm also wondering if he sticks with that. You know, if it, given his opposition, does that mean this this proposal is DOA? Well, what I would say is that the uh, the president's budget is a classic Joe Biden budget. It is focused on uh, security. It is focused on uh, our uh, on, on um, security in our communities, security abroad, uh, and it was designed in order to help ensure that we have the money in reserve to pay for and bring down the deficit 
uh, even after Congress sends us uh, whatever they ultimately uh, send us on the proposals that he uh, very much wants to see passed to lower prescription drug costs, to lower the cost of child care, to tackle the climate crisis. So uh, the key uh, priorities uh, in this budget um, are those and, uh, and ensuring that the wealthiest uh, pay their fair share. Obviously, uh, I think Senator Manchin and President Biden share a belief that the rich should pay their fair share. Uh, and will allow the process of negotiation uh, to work itself out. We're not, I'm obviously not going to negotiate from the podium, um, but I do think that uh, Senator Manchin and President Biden shared that fundamental belief that the rich should, should pay their fair share, the wealthiest, I should say, should pay their fair share. Um, and so uh, we'll continue uh, to work with him and to work with Congress to move these forward. 21 states have filed a lawsuit against the government because of the mass mandates on transportation. I wonder if the White House is prepared through the CDC to issue some new guidelines to lift these mass mandates. Uh, so I don't have any news to make on this at this moment. I will say um, uh, these are conversations that are, are underway. And certainly when we have news to make on this, we'll come back to you. Thank you, Kay. Um, when I asked Jake Sullivan uh, the question of whether no one in the administration had said definitively whether or not the White House thinks that Ukraine can win this war, um, he referred me to the Pentagon. And moments ago, when the same question was asked to you, you said, um, you know, I don't know, I, ha what, I don't know, I have to say it. Um, the, the president has, has said, I don't care what Putin thinks. So why isn't the administration being more definitive on this question? Is it for fear that this might provoke Moscow? Is it that you don't have a clear definition of what victory might look like over there? I think what is important here, as I said in my previous answer, I think what's important here is our actions. I think we have uh, we have provided the security assistance, we've provided the weapons uh, to Ukraine, we continue to support Ukraine, we continue to do everything in our power to ensure that they have what they need. So I think if there's, uh, I don't think there should be any question about whether uh, this White House and this president uh, is doing everything in his power to uh, to support Ukraine in the face of Russian aggression. Thank you, Kate. It, it, uh, two questions, one on your own, one on uh, electric vehicle. So on your own, today, uh, Secretary uh, Blinken had announced a new sanction against Iran over the ballistic missile uh, activities. Will this endanger the nuclear talk? Sorry. The second part. Uh, sorry, uh, so second part. This endanger uh, the nuclear nuclear talk. Uh, uh, no, not at all. Uh, in fact, uh, these sanctions are not connected to the Iran deal. They demonstrate, in fact, what we have always said, which is that we will continue to hold Iran accountable for its missile proliferation and support to proxy networks as we work diplomatically to place strict limits on its nuclear program. So that will be true whether we are back in the nuclear deal or not. And the sanctions that we're applying today will remain in place whether or not we're back in the nuclear deal. But as you know, it is our firm view that getting out of the deal was a disaster. And second, that these other problems, missiles and proxies, are better addressed without Iran at the nuclear breakout threshold. Uh, so ultimately, uh, we are able to uh, hold Iran accountable uh, on issues like the missile program uh, while uh, continuing to work toward uh, a, a potential deal to limit their nuclear program. Second question on the electric vehicle. So yesterday, you announced the investment in electric vehicle. And this week, actually, a Chinese company called uh, Simcor, which is Shanghai Energy New Material Technology, just announced a new electric vehicle battery investment in Ohio, which will create around uh, 1,200 jobs. We know pushing cutting edge technology and preserving supply chain is Biden administration's priority. But would you also worry about national security aspects and future supply chain concern over a Chinese investment on those items? Well, as you say, a, a significant economic priority, a significant plank of the Biden economic agenda uh, is bringing our supply chains to America, making more in America, manufacturing in America. Uh, the president has been very focused on taking steps to ensure that we're doing that. And we're seeing investment. Um, you know, you'll all remember the investment uh, that Intel announced a couple of months ago. Uh, you know, these are investments that uh, are in happening in part because uh, President Biden is creating an environment where uh, companies feel uh, like they will get the support and they will uh, therefore bring their jobs here. Uh, on the national security question, I would only say, of course, we would always uh, uh, review and undertake all of the necessary uh, steps, but I don't have anything beyond that to say. Oh, okay. Thank, Thank you all. Appreciate it.